critiquing design is a sort of training ground for configuring complexity so that those questions around identity, race, um, how, you know, <laughs> the cri like global crisis, guilt, you know, trap, all, all of this stuff that we find ourselves in, um, it no longer becomes overwhelming and we just sort of step away from it or just go, I don't know how to do that or just go apathetic. I think apathy is the end of us. But we go, oh, this is a lot to hold. <laughs> This is a ton to hold. It's actually kind of impossible to all hold at once, but how can we slowly weave it together and integrate it and to hold that? And sometimes the holding is enough. And that's what I like to tell people, like I think of this term, like we gotta be post guilt. Welcome to Whole and Unleashed, a podcast about coming home to ourselves. I'm your host, Jessica Locke, a holistic mindset, strala yoga, and human design guide. This podcast is not about telling you what to do. It's about sharing stories and tools to connect to your inner wisdom and maybe give you an extra nudge towards living wholeheartedly. Because deep down, only you know what's best for you. We'll be talking mindset, business, recovering from burnout, human design, transitions, and so much more. Let's dive in, shall we? Hi everyone, I'm so excited for today's episode. This is, I don't even know how to describe. <laughs> Teo, you're like a mentor of mine. I learned human design through you, but also just an amazing human being who's able to bring in the systems that support us, but also give us space as we learn about it. <laughs> this is the best way I can introduce. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. So I met Teo maybe like a year, a year and a half ago as I was getting into the human design rabbit hole. And I know you've been in this process, I guess, working with human design specifically for like almost nine, 10 years. It'll be 10 next year this time. So nine oh right now. Yeah, yeah, nine right now. So tell us a little bit about yourself, I guess. Who are you? Who were you before finding human design and how it's change along the years yeah danjo shi teo shiji um my name is teo i'm a enrolled member of the leap on apache band of texas um and yeah i've been in human design for i was initiated into it in uh back in 2013 you know so when i was still living in um, the very beginning of 2013, but when I was still living in California, I now live in, in Santa Fe in New Mexico. Um, I was initiated into it by a lovely manifester, a one form manifester, splenic manifester with the 4521 and rocked my entire world. I was like the second time working with this woman, I was helping her move houses to Hawaii. And the second time I'm sitting there, she's chain smoking cigarettes. I'm chain smoking cigarettes and <laughs> sobbing. And she's telling me about my human design. And I'm like, what is happening right now? What, who are you? What is happening? <laughs> and um, she had studied with Ra and worked a lot on some of the rave psychology work. My name is Richard Garuti. And yeah, that's how I got inducted into the system. And it was a long, you know, we had a long sort of relationship. And um, I eventually kind of became a mentee to her and she's, you know, was part of my family. She passed away last August. Um, and she pushed me into eventually doing human design uh, training, analyst training through human design worldwide in 2018. She was like, you need to do this. I, you got to do it. Like I'll pay for it. You just have to get in there. And I was like, no, don't pay for it. I'll do it. She pushed me in, get that manifestor yeah. initiation going, <laughs> going on. And um yeah, started showing up and in, on Instagram in 2019 and had no idea. I'd only learned about human design from a bunch of like old hippies, you know, <laughs> so it was really surprising to see that there's a thriving community and that community has expanded exponentially in the last three or four years. Like, I don't even know when it started, it was like four people. <laughs> yeah. And then I got pulled into him like, what is this? <laughs> Yeah, so so my work is really uh, human design is not the entirety of my work. I do a lot of work with um, I consider myself an indigenous futurist. So I do uh, writing and music and all these things in the indigenous futurism realm. 
as well as um, I'm really working towards integrating sort of this myth mythic thinking and ecological thinking within human design system and archetypal systems like human design, like Western astrology um, and all of those things. And so I'm really trying to situate human design in a little more of have a, have a little more depth to it than just the personal development because i think it's a brilliant tool of personal development like one of the best out there and i've always felt this sort of at odds feeling of is it enough just to develop ourselves is it enough just to heal is it enough when i look around the world and in my communities and my ecologies and all of them are having a difficult time in this mm -hmm. huge transformation that's happening globally is it enough just for me to heal it's necessary for me to do that, but I've held this question for a long time of how do we bring our gifts, our essence, who we are to the world in ways that are generative that aren't just, you know, having a business or having, um, you know, doing X, Y, and Z, being liberated in yourself, but actually bring it back. And and because we really, and, and it is my opinion that we need to be oriented eco ecologically and towards our communities to survive this good old climate change and these this meta crisis this huge change in the world around us so i've been really holding that big vision as i continue to expand my human design work and human design is the basis of all of my work it's just such an mm -hmm. integral part of who i am yeah yeah and i love how you're able to contextualize in such a way because yes maybe it starts with taking care of ourselves and healing all that but there is a bigger picture that sometimes I think it gets lost. And this is at least for me, the first time I'm seeing it contextualized and almost humanized in a way, because mm -hmm. we are living in this realm, this 3D world where there is an ecological crisis, there is crisis with society, with how things are set up. How can we bring this tool that is so helpful now in a collective and in a societal way and how did you start it weaving those things together i know because like part of it's because you've been in this process for so long you you're able to you know hold this question and expand on it but were they ever at odds oh at one point? yeah absolutely and I, I think what the the thing that was the most difficult for me to sort of claim human design as this viable system is that because where i'm coming from uh, you know, I'm a mixed indigenous man, and I've always held that sort of tension between this indigenous worldview that I was raised with, um, the complications of reconnecting with ancestry, my whiteness, and I've, and I've always held that tension throughout my entire life. And a lot of the work that I did before human design, I worked with native-led nonprofits, was very focused on ecology, traditional ecological knowledge, like sort of resituating indigenous knowledge as something that is vi viable and not only viable, but like actually better suited to deal with the problems of the world than uh, ecological sciences even are, because these are thousands and thousands of years of oral sciences that are um, very advanced and very um, powerful. And so I was coming from there, from that place, and the human design sort of new age spiritual wellness space has always been, I've always been adjacent to that like my parents, you know, my mom's, mom's a hippie, you know, that's <laughs> it's been around for a long time. And, um, and I just, I, you know, following my design, I was just, I'm a, I'm a mental projector, my environment dic sort of sounds kind of dictator, like but <laughs> dictates what's expressing what's pouring out of me, what's flowing out of me. And so I just turned towards this human design, but I always felt this sense of like, what am I doing supporting people's healings while there's my home communities, um, these these places that I call home. I grew up in Paradise, California, or right around there. Went to high school there, and that was, you know, had one of the largest fires in U.S. history mm -hmm. pour through there um, back in I think 2018. And, you know, I was just I was really struggling with like being online in the human design space and supporting people, and then having this feeling of like disconnect, deep disconnect. And and frankly, if I can be frank, it's it's largely white folks, it's largely white women that are in that space that are learning about these things and engaging with them. And it's such a joy to support them. And there is this disconnect for me of like, this is not the communities I always want to serve, nor is this um, meeting these sort of questions, these big existential questions that I'm carrying around based on my experiences and my identities. 
And so I just have been with that question the entire time I've been with human design. Um, and for a long time, I thought it was sort of, there wasn't a way to have them meet and to integrate. And that's been really my project for the last two years. It's like, we've, I, I want to bring an ecological lens into human design. I want to bring, um, I believe in this system. I use it every single day. I think it is such a beautiful tool for understanding the complexity of human being human. And there's so much wisdom here and it's accessible to so many people. Really, when you think about it, um, it's very complicated, but it's still fairly accessible. It's literally more accessible than like ecological literacy event to a yeah. lot of folks, you know? Yeah. So I'm just really working with um, how do we infuse all of these different stories, all of these different perspectives, all of these different identities that are sometimes at odds and how do we work with them all together? And that's really where I came up with this myth mending work, which is about using all of these different archetypal systems, our stories, our ancestry, our lineages. So many of us are diasporic or immigrants, you know, in, in America. And we're deeply disconnected from our, our, our origins. So how can we reclaim those and reconfigure them, not forget them, not make something new, but reconfigure them so that they can better meet the challenges of life in the 21st century. Oof. So that's no what biggie. I want to do. <laughs> no biggie. No biggie. I'm, I'm, I'm all collective uh, thinking. So that's my oh. definition is purely collective. So this is, this is the realm that I'm in, you know, so yeah. often. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you for sharing that because you sh you're also touching on like the gaps in not just human design, but also in the wellness industry, in the healing mm -hmm. industry, which is, you know, start with the self and all that's important. But if we go back to, for me, if I go back to Peru, it's a third world country, I can do all the self healing and it, and it, you know, what is the point of me being in a great place healthy if I see my country or the place that my parents, my friends live at, not thriving, being at loss. But then sometimes that's so big for one person to hold, to try to solve. So I'm really grateful that, you know, you were designed for this, but you're also like, I'm sure it wasn't easy for you, but also like holding that and also bringing us into this experience of like, how can we it's also ancestry healing, like our stories mm -hmm. that we've held on. It's so much that we're working through that's being, you know, in a container of human design amongst many other things that you offer. Yeah, and, and this is this is why I like I often look at human design as a sort of training for us to configure and understand complexity. You know, when you become a proficient reader, when you learn to synthesize the material, you're not just going you're a generator, you have emotional, you know, you're not just doing the list of details, which is still very useful, but you're actually synthesizing it like you're a generator and you have the 10, 20, and you have a one, four profile and you're doing all of this. Um, and I think all archetypal systems do this. You know, I see people do those tarot spreads that are like 20 cards and they're, and they're weaving a story with all of those different aspects of, of humanity, of consciousness. And I, and I look at human design as a sort of training ground for configuring complexity. So that those questions around identity, race, um, how, you know, <laughs> the, the like global crisis, guilt, you know, travel, all, all of this stuff that we find ourselves in, um, it no longer becomes overwhelming and we just sort of step away from it or just go, I don't know how to do that or just go apathetic. I think apathy is the end of us, but we go, oh, this is a lot to hold. <laughs> this is a ton to hold. It's actually kind of impossible to all hold at once. But how can we slowly weave it together and integrate it and to hold that? And sometimes the holding is enough. And that's what I like to tell people. Mm -hmm. Like I think of this term, like we got to be post guilt. This shit has happened. Doesn't mean we need ignore it. Doesn't mean we act like it doesn't exist. It just means that I'm like, yes, my folks went through, my peoples went through a genocide and I'm also part white. And there's climate change. And I see, you know, the killing of Black folks in the street. And, you know, <laughs> I hold all of that and go, this is a problem. It's a lot. I'm going to grieve what I can grieve. I'm going to hold what I can hold. And then I'm going to step into the future going, how, how might we? This isn't about solving it. It's all about understanding your place as an individual, your healing that's necessary, your individual growth, so that you can meet the complexity of the moment we're in. You know, if you're in survival mode, you're not gonna be able to meet it. 
Yes. If you're just going, if you're raising three children and ha having two jobs and, you know, you were, you had alcohol issues in your past or with your parents or whatever, you're not going to be worried about the crises of the planet. You can't, you know, you do yeah. need to have that healing and we need to have that individual sort of progress and development happen. But there is a point in which the personal development is stopped by not considering the global condition. Yeah. Right? At some point, your personal development can't go any further until you start to integrate maybe just your local community, maybe your local ecology, and then maybe start thinking about big collective issues. And if at some point you at some point you have to turn towards that, and that's where your further liberation and further purpose and meaning in your life starts to show itself. Hmm. Which also, it's also kind of a reflection of even the circuitry of our body graph. You know, it yes. starts at an individual level, whenever we can take care of ourselves. And then the community, when we're able to have that, you know, feeling safe in those spaces, being able to support one another and then collective. And it's just so beautiful and powerful to see this starting to take shape through what you're doing. And can you talk a little bit about what does myth mending be? What, what are myths? Why are they important? Why are archetypes such an important part of our lives that we don't realize even? Yeah. And, and before I do that, I just want to say like everything I'm talking about is because I've studied, you know, I'm, I studied anthropology um, in school, you know, have, have written extensively about colonization and, and, you know, I've like had these frames, but yeah. it was really working with human design and working with the circuitry in particular and understanding that they are playing into each other and need each other. And the individual development, the communal development, and the collective development are all part of an individual's development. And so yeah. all those things I said are also based in the sort of understanding of these sort of three levels of human experience. So I just want to name that, yeah. just showing that human design is this thing to help us understand complexity. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so, so myth mending and why myths are so important. So... You know, we're, we're in an age now where um, deconstruction, uh, apathy, nihilism, and liberation are like the milieu, right? Especially being online in the 21st century. It's kind of like we're breaking down systems of power. We're negating Western sciences. We're negating Western politics. We're negating Western colonialism in, in, in large. You know, that is sort of the progressive ideology is to sort of go, what's going on here? Do we actually want this? What is actually useful? And that's very valuable. And the time before that was in which, you know, supremacy reigned and idealism and sort of manifest destiny, this idea that there was some ideal that humans, mostly white European humans were moving towards, right? They were holding the narrative, but they had a narrative, a meta narrative about who they were, why they were there. And all religions across the world carry what are called these meta narratives, these myths that contextualize what it means to be a human. If you're Christian or Muslim or Buddhist, you have these stories that say, this is how you're supposed to act. This is how you're supposed to move through the world. This is what relationship is. This is what this means. This is how you treat each other, right? So we, we, we are constantly configured by story, right? And when you think of the, bring a little human design, bring in, think in the writing will cross of laws, we got 56 and 50 talking about storytelling and our values of how we treat each other are based in our stories. It's how we commune. So meta narratives carry with them intents, right? They carry an intent. They have a teleology. They're moving towards something. And everything that is mythic is moving towards something. Now, the modernist narratives of like manifest destiny in like my people's case of like, oh, we're just the westward expansion. We are going to tame America. Um, this is going to happen. It's going to be a promised land. All these things. That was a myth. That was a story. That was a meta narrative that enabled governments, individual actions. Um, it, it changed the face of the planet, right? Oh. Holding that myth. And now we're in this extreme place of like, we don't always agree with those myths. We don't agree with all of the things, right? There's a big turning away and a deep criticism of Western science being the best, Western politics, democracy being the best. Um, and I'm not here to debate which things are right or wrong. That's I'm, I'm not interested in, the, in those debates, but I am very interested in 
creating new myths that better attend to the complexity of what we're experiencing now with the ecological crisis, uh, deep disconnection from our ecologies, from our natural places around us. Um, and we need stories that are not just whimsical fantasy tales. I think that's what people think when you listen to a myth or folklore, it's just a whimsical fantasy tale. It's like, no, yeah. myths are quite literally reflections of the human and ecological interaction and experience um, that we've, we've always carried. Myths are how we define who we are. And so myth mending is about bringing that process back to the individual, right? When, when it's held on a collective level or a communal level, as it is in many religions, the individual is not part and parcel of making and creating. And they are part of that myth. They help, you know, expand it and all those things, but they aren't part of making it. And we have come to a point with consciousness where we're so individualized and we're not going to step away from that. That's not going to disappear. You know, as much as I have criticisms around individualism, the individual yeah. is the place. So myth mending is about calling that practice of meaning making, of myth making, of story making back into our own personal being. And mm -hmm. coming from, you know, folks that are deeply disconnected from their places of origin, from their folklores, from their tales, you know, they don't, they've moved six times in their life. They don't even know what plants and animals and people are outside of their window. You know, I've been there. How do you make myths? How do you make stories about who you are? The primary story many of us are living within is one that has been marketed to us through our seeking of capital to exist in a capitalist system. Again, not here to argue if that's good or bad or whatever, but that is what gives us our myth. That is what gives us our story. I am an IT professional working in tech in the Bay Area, and this is the culture. Yeah. This is how we talk. This is what I'm here for. This is what we do. That's, that was my myth. That was my story. Um, but I knew there was more. And so it was this process of myth mending is using whatever archetypal material, and I'll break down what archetypes are in a minute, using whatever materials around us, our own, you know, that those, those stories you hear about from your father about his great grandfather and how they acted, um, you know, things you hear about from where your people came from, things you hear about what happened in your community before, um, you know, just all anything that is story material, mm -hmm. you know, the rock around the corner, the tree around the corner, and, and start using that as materials to create this, weave together this personal myth that you are situated in. So I'm not walking out the door being, I'm the IT professional who works at this company. I'm walking out the door and going, oh, I'm Teo of this, this itch I wish, this, this um, yucca, because this yucca and I have a conversation every so often. And I'm, I'm situated in relationship to it. I'm Teo of the Montoyas. I come from this family and this is what we carry. And this is sort of the, the stories that define us. And reclaiming that and going, how does that fit in the world as it is now, in this technologically advanced, increasingly complex world. And that's not an easy thing to do, but we have yeah. to start somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I love that because as I was hearing it, it's definitely reclaiming and also rooting into that identity because it's so easy to just reclaim this is me and we forget it because of the programming of society we forget it because of our daily lives and you know things are happening that might be stressful but like rooting into that that is able to connect us to where we come from to our dna to like you know our belief and how we're set up that's profound yeah and, and i mean how many of us you know spend a week at work then come back and go, why the hell, why am I here? Why am I yeah. doing what I'm doing? What is going on here? You know, like what, what is the point of all of this? Yeah. You know, I have success. I have friends. I have all these things, but there's still something that's missing within me. And that to me is meaning is what is the meaning of this? And because our culture as a, as a whole, like the sort of Western culture, global culture is becoming more critical. It's kind of going, oh, these things that were meaningful before are no longer working, you know? They're not, it's not just enough to have the family and the white picket fence and the American dream. There's, there's something else that, that need, there's something else that I'm needing, right? Yeah. And so people speak spirit, seek spirituality to try to discover that meaning. And 
spirituality is a personal process. And I think that's the beginning, you know, as we have spiritual experiences, as we learn spiritual systems, yoga, human design, whatever it is, we start to understand what's meaningful to us, what feels good in our bodies. Like this feels like meaningful to me. And still my small, very gentle critique is to what end do you learn yoga? To what end do you learn human design? If you want to feel like you're living a meaningful life, you want to do work that feels good to you, if you want to do, those are great. And also when the fire comes to your back door and you have to evacuate, you start questioning like, what's going on here? (laughs) It's not enough for me just to live a meaningful life. It has to be situated in my community. Somebody in our community, uh, there's, there's something violent that happens in our community. We lose a community member. Suddenly our questions of what's meaningful, it starts to shift. And that's going to happen um, more and more. And yeah. that's just a reality that I hold and that I think we see reflected. And it doesn't have to be despair or loss. It, it just has to be a re-reckoning with, let's move this meaning-making process that so many of us are on in the spiritual wellness space and start recontextualizing it. And do it so gently, not do it from this place of, oh, you're not, you don't know six plants outside your door. Yeah. You're no good. Yes. You know, it's like, you're not worthy of spirit. It's like, no, we are children. <laughs> we are, we have really have a lot to learn. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love how you pointed out, again, another gap in the wellness industry where we get into those spaces of like, okay, how do we make meaning for ourselves? And then we start we might shift into an angle we're doing all these things wrong <laughs> like oh i'm not following my strategy and authority and all that that is something that i'm very conscious because i've been there that i'm like anybody who comes to me like you are not doing life wrong like you're not making the wrong choice you did not spill your coffee because you didn't follow your authority like because then we start to think like oh because i did x wrong then this is all the bad things that are happening to me and then we live from a place almost like where religion puts you at least with Catholicism, like the Ten Commandments, you don't follow them. So you get sick, you get all that. No, like it happens to you might get sick just because so much is happening, not because you ate the wrong thing, not because you did not listen to your spleen, you know, and just being able to shift that, like you say, very gently, because we get into those spaces and we're being preached at when you do yoga every day, when you sleep eight hours, then your life is going to be the best thing possible. Even with, I think, human design, with how a lot of people sell it, or they want to talk about the great thing of, which is true to an extent of following your strategy and authority. It's so important, but that does not guarantee your life will be rainbows and butterflies. Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely not. <laughs> and yeah, and this is, I think you're getting an excellent point. That is something that um, I'm, you know, you see in the space, these sort of reactions to everybody's body should work this way. Everybody should look this way. Everybody should do these things. And people are really pushing against that now. It's like, no, you're not going to tell me how to eat, how to sleep, how to do anything. That idealism that was often bound up in uh, one whiteness and also these, these ideas of, of like these sort of puritanical religious ideas of like, there's a right way to do everything. You know, this sort of postmodern mode is what I call, you know, what we, what I would describe it as of, of being critical of those things, of that they're actually being relative, that those don't work for everybody. There are people who exist outside of these ideal ways of you have to wake up every day and do this, and that's the only way to reach enlightenment or to reach whatever and all this stuff. All of that feeds into this this very this thing very attached to um, the Western colonial culture and global culture at this point of there's badness and there's goodness. You know, and of course we can get into the details of that, but there's this the puritanical thing of like you do something bad and you get bad in return. Cause and, and effect. <laughs> just cause and effect. And of course, you know, we can split hairs about what is and isn't that, but there's this feeling people have, this deep guilt of like, oh my God, I didn't follow my strategy and authority. Oh my God, I'm trying to figure out why I'm suffering. Is it my fault? Is it society's fault? Is it my family's fault? Is it my family trauma, whatever it is, this the suffering that they're feeling. And something that I think is so beautiful about reclaiming myth and re, and working um, and sort of working from this sort of complexity lens is going, there's so many things. There's no one thing that defines who we are. There's many things that define who we are. And really, we can heal. We can put a lot of work into healing. 
And if we're constantly looking for that one way of being in which everything will be perfect and everything will be good and everything will be fine, um, we're doing ourselves and the world a disservice, I believe. You know, so how do we bring in the complexity lens to our own lives? It's like, yeah, there's all, you know, you could give me all kinds of different diagnoses or you could say that I'm not doing this, this and this and that's why I feel like this. And all of that is worthy of exploring. And there's this point I, I, where I come back to, but where are we going, you know? And there's something called um, ACT, which is, uh, and I'm forgetting the, the name of it, but it's a, it's a sort of cognitive behavioral therapy adjacent um, therapy. And it's, and um, wow, I can't remember what, what ACT stands for. But, it's going to uh, come, it's going to come back. It's going to come, it's going to come. <laughs> but it's, a, it's sort of mindfulness based and it's sort of going, yes, this is what I'm experiencing. Yes, I have all of these stories around that. And where am I going? I'm going to choose where I'm going. And um, there's something so powerful in intent. And that's what I think is something that's really missing from the conversation. It's not about doing things because they're right or wrong, but coming from this deep place of individual and understanding yourself as an individual and going, these are my skills. These are my competencies. This is what I love. This is what I feel like hold in a sense. And I'm going to do something with that. I'm going to put that towards something. I'm, the goal is not for me to heal. The goal is for me to put back into the world. And that also means skipping just the service-oriented narrative too, because there is this service-oriented narrative of like, just give everything. Give up the world, give everything, and then, and then you'll be fine. Um, which maybe that does work for some people. But I think it yeah. skips a lot of healing and complexity before that. So how do we go, yeah, I need to heal. I got some healing to do. Like, really, yeah, there's some trauma here. There's some things I need to contend with. And at what point am I okay enough to start pouring myself into the world, to start being generative with my energy, bringing things? And especially, this is a question for generators. Where is that life force going? You're here to generate life. You know, at what point is your life okay enough to start doing that, taking on that sacred responsibility? Right, so. I love that you also said like at what point is your life okay for you to start doing that instead of doing the thing and expecting to feel full satisfied which is where we start I think it's also such a human thing and a conditioning thing where we want to have the answer whatever the answer is we will want the right or wrong because the complexity is too much to hold we don't know how to hold the complexity like I just want to get better now are you telling me there's 20 steps and I have to do a few years no like if I look back at my, my healing journey I would have like kicked and screamed like why is there not a quick fix because when we're in whatever space we are we want it to be over but the complexity and beauty of human is that you know, in between the healing, in between the discovering and like mending our stories, releasing the old stories, we also get to enjoy life a little bit. Like we, we're we not supposed to suffer until we hit whatever that healing pull is. And this is, and this is why I love like AJ Marie Brown's work and Audre Lorde's work on just like the the, the erotic as power and, and pleasure, uh, pleasure activism and all these things. Cause it's just, that's also a central aspect of our, of our living. And I, I'm speaking from a place of, I, I get very serious far too often, you know, <laughs> and that joy is the central resource to actually living life. And we have to live life. So I love that you brought that in. We have to live life to actually have the energy, to have that settled nervous system that can even look at a situation and not just be in, oh my God, it's terror all the time. And I got to fix everything and everything's bad and all this stuff needs to happen. But to go like, no, life life is good and it's difficult and it's lovely and it's complex. And I'm, I'm always thinking of like, w as we're doing this inner work, as we're doing, you know, in these spiritual wellness spaces, as we're using all of these systems and we're trying to figure out what's going on with me, I want to feel better, you know, what's going on with society, maybe that's influenced, all of those questions. What comes after awareness? I think right now we expect that liberation comes strictly after awareness, that the second we have it all figured out, we'll be liberated, we'll be free, everything will be bright and shiny. Unfortunately, when I look around, I say, we can be as liberated as we possibly want, which is a good goal, is a necessary goal, but then you're going to look around and there's a lot to clean up. <laughs> there's a yes. lot of work to do. So what comes after awareness? What comes after liberation? And that is where intent comes from that's where where purpose and meaning really step in that mm -hmm. is where all of a sudden it's like oh I'm aware of all of this in me 
And then what's the point of having that awareness? You know, you bring up such a like an interesting phase that we go through. It's almost like we're awakened, whatever we want to call it. And then we see all the things that need to be cleaned up. It feels very demotivating. And I've seen people sometimes go back into like, I wish things <laughs> were before I found out about this. So how do you help navigate and like, you know, expand like, yes, you are liberated, you are awakened. This also sucks. <laughs> what can we do to start, I guess, holding that, the complexity? In, in one word, it's, it's, it's grieve. Oh, yeah. It's grieve. That we need to grieve the complexity, the difficulty, the hurt, the fact that all of these dreams that we were given, especially as, as millennials here, uh, <laughs> these dreams that we were given, they don't pan out. In fact, things aren't idealistic. Things aren't moving towards some perfectly defined ideal. They're much more complicated than that. And that perfect ideal was also had a very large, bright white golden carpet over the bodies and, and lives of many, you know, people who suffered to, to reach that ideal. And that, that is why, to me, it, it's all about grief. It's all mm -hmm. about grieving what we don't even know is there. We don't even, when, when you get to the point where you realize that how much has been lost to the world and how much needs to work, the only way to move towards that in a healthy way is to grieve it. Because, you know, I like I have this little little linear sort of trajectory of mine. It's like we we find ourselves at a at a dark night. We go, I'm in a, a, a job that I hate. I just lost my partner. Um, I am going into a horrible depression and anxiety. So you guys just had a bunch of panic attacks. Um, I need to get out of this. This is horrible. Okay, well, let's go in. You know, you pull up a podcast, you try out some meditation. You start looking into these other things. Oh, astrology is around. Okay, what's this about? Um, then two years later, you're certified as a yoga instructor and you're doing that thing. And that feels really good. And this isn't a call out. I swear. It's, <laughs> that's not what it is. Yeah. It's just, you know, you move from that place of, I need to bring awareness and healing to my life. And then you start engaging with that. And the more and more awareness sort of shows up, um, you either say, oh, I got it all figured out and this is it. I'm good here. I'm just going to focus on my life and my family and, and that's what's good. And then something comes along and knocks on your door and sort of pulls you out of that. And this is where people split. Either they go the deep sort of um, psychological nihilism where they just go, nothing matters. And maybe they even go downhill after a little while, or they go full on savior. Um, a lot of technocratic white men love to do this. Go, well, we're just going to use technology to save the world in all of these perfect ways and sort of continue this idealistic view of, of humanity and um, that this will happen. And they put all their energy and a bunch of beautiful things happen from that, by the way, you know, yeah. you know, a bunch of beautiful innovations and things that are going to support humanity happen from that. And I still think it's missing something. Or they do the peace out move, which is actually, I have it all figured out. This is just the Maya. This is just the illusion. That's all it is. And I'm just here to be present. And that's it. And there's truth in that as well. You know, there is beauty in that. But it's this kind of place of that sort of, um, there's a very specific term I'm thinking of here. But yeah, just that ascending out of the situation. And for me, being somebody who has always been situated in, in sort of indigenous cosmologies and ways of viewing things, I've always felt this like it's a responsibility to take care of Earth and actually Earth is only what it is because we have tended it. Mm -hmm. And so I was always very confused about this disconnection from earth and not this rooting into. And that's where this, like people move that, they go through the dark night of the soul, they become the savior, the ascendant, or, you know, the nihilist. And I'm actually calling like, okay, it's time to come back and face the complexity of this. And that literally means that it's so complex that sometimes you quite literally can't understand all of it. Yeah. Like, I don't understand all of it. Maybe if you're a PhD for like 10 years studying all the like multidisciplinary PhD, you can start to get a picture of like complex systems. But just to acknowledge that there is complexity, that I think is the number one most important thing. And then try to make stories that move beyond that complexity. Again, the mm -hmm. fact that the meta narratives and, and those things. So, you know, how can I, in that complexity, find a point in the future that I can move towards. 
yeah, I don't know what's causing all the fires in northern New Mexico right now. I couldn't tell you all the ecological facts about that. And I want to move towards this. Mm. That is hopefully going to help me understand why that's happening. Yeah, yeah. And, and And like you said, all the perspectives are important. You know, those who want to use technology, those who want to, you know, come back. And I'm wondering, as you're speaking to that, is that a Obviously, there is no one answer, but is that the time where we went from individual and now we're moving towards more a community focus? Is that when we start leaning on each other, that could be helpful? Yeah, and this is sort of the integral approach. So integral systems is is, uh, something created by Ken Wilber, and he talks about these developmental models moving towards complexity. And um, that's exactly what I think is happening, is that right now, I think people at the cutting edge are people who are trying to take all of those different things the psychological nihilism, the technocratic idealism, and this ascendant non-dual spiritual sort of way of seeing the world and trying to weave it together and try to bring it together and and start to talk across lines, not going that, oh, well, just this one thing is going to fix all these problems. You know, no, it's like we got to have a, a network, a rhizome of interconnection that allows us to even configure complexity. And I think human design and um, is beautiful for this because it talks about synarchy, about this place that none of us are here to hold everything. None Mm. of our purposes are here to do all. We are equal and we each have places and strengths. You know, I was just talking um, with my friend about this of, of how do we take leadership from this hierarchical position into a skill based position? As in, like, we need leaders, but we don't need leaders because they're hierarchically more important. We need leaders because it's a skill that is necessary. You know, we need people who are good at, I'm gonna talk to a crowd of people, get them all on board, get us all moving towards something, but that's not a hierarchical thing, that's a skill-based thing. And Mm -hmm. so the synarchy is about, in human design, is seeing like we're all these unique individual people and we all have this unique eco-cultural niche. We each have this place where these gifts and these skills and these energies we carry that can meet some need in, in, in the other, in our communities, in the world at large. Um, and that need can literally be making people laugh. You know, that's necessary. That's necessary to the complex system. It can be somebody who's in the dirt, digging things up, doing this hard manual labor to make sure that something happens, something gets planted, something gets, you know, pulled out of the ground, whatever it is but we need people in their perspective places. And that's why like, to me, the deconditioning process is vital because it's like, come back to what your actual gifts and your true essence and your authenticity is because that's what we all need. And that's a whole process. And sometimes we have to do that process while we're looking like the forest burning in the eye, <laughs> you know, or some, some, some other political, ecological, cultural crisis in the eye. And we're going, well, I still need to figure out what my true essence is, you know? <laughs> It's vital and that can't be the end. Yeah, yeah. You're like expanding my mind in so many ways because I appreciate, I think I've always seen it, but I just did not know how to hold it. And so much of one of the things I really love about human design was that how it was able to kind of separate people in a way that, you know, this is your skill, this is what you're here here to do and when I watch documentaries of people who are trying to figure out how to like fix pollution and all that I'm like thank god there are people who love doing research (laughs) because me I would never have the skill set to do it not because I'm not enough not because of that it's just I my brain doesn't even know where to start versus me doing something else that's very easy to me and being able to tap into those people their natural essence and how can we strengthen it and keep nourishing that as opposed to like fixing what's the next approach to feel enlightened (laughs) and that and this is why like i'm so interested in an eco-cultural approach to human design as opposed to this sort of okay your gifts are for humanity alone usually human design is focused on like these are your gifts in humanity and i like this sort of broaden that these are your gifts in ecology like the entire ecology Mm -hmm. meaning with the earth and with our more than human kin and, and this is like, when you talk about those folks who are, they found their thing, you know what I mean? And they're successful at it, but they found their thing and they're doing work. Their lives aren't always easy. That doesn't mean their lives are easy, you know, or, but it's, I mean, there might be a bunch of wonderful things that happen, but they have that sort of 
bigger and intense, especially generators where they're just like, oh, they found their thing that they love doing, you know? Yeah. And I think we need as many people operating there, but the deconditioning process and the sort of, you know, global culture and capitalist culture that we find ourselves in, it is so easy to not actually tune into one's own authenticity, own, own gifts, all of those things, and instead um, focus on what we've been conditioned to focus on, becoming a doctor or becoming all these things. And there are people who are here to become doctors. Their skill sets, their energies, all the things, they're going to be great at it, you know? Yeah. And there's people that go down that road and it's not working for them. And their life force peters out and they have all these, you know, they just, they have all these struggles. Um, so I'm saying all that just because it's like the deconditioning process is so vital. And I'm worried that people think deconditioning just ends at, oh, I'm different mm -hmm. and I'm going to do my own thing. And I can only be a solopreneur or an entrepreneur. I can't be plugged into the system the same way. And I'm like, there's truth in that. Yes, you're differentiating. You're realizing that these systems of culture that you're in don't work for you. Beautiful. I'm right there with you. Don't work for me. Um, and I'm like, but, but it has to go towards something. Like it has to move towards community care, towards this, this sort of seeing, oh, the only reason I am even able to be me is because I've been held by an ecology, an eco-cultural community of people of the land, of all these things. And I have a responsibility to them to bring myself forth as much as I can and bring my essence and my goodness forth, but not just for the sake of doing it for me, but that because it's needed in this larger communal context. And I'm saying that, and there's a little asterisk here that there's sometimes <laughs> there's deeply individual people that I'm like, you know, they should not be worried about what other people are needing all the time. Yeah. And they still exist in a complex system. They still exist in a system of connection, communion, and the food they eat, everything. They're in this system. They just don't, we don't see it. We don't need to see it at this point. Right. At some point, we will if things keep getting difficult. And in places of the, of the world, you do see those. You see that you have to get food this way. It doesn't just sort of, it's not just there for you. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah, even if they have a lot of individual circuitry, if they're able to honor that, it's kind of like it echoes. It echoes to somebody else who's watching who might have community secretary and all that. And then like, we're all echoes of each other. We cannot, as much as we live on an island alone, we're going to be affecting the next island as much as we don't want to. It's We're connected. That's, you know, can't, yeah, can't cut that cord. <laughs> like I have no individual like definition, like I have hanging gates that are individual, of course. And I have all the collective and I just always think of the collective stuff like all I'm doing is slanging individual other individuals, <laughs> people who have deep, in, you know, 43, 23 energy or whatever it is. And I'm just putting it together and I'm trying to weave it together and talk to mm -hmm. talk about it and, and tell the details of it. But like the individual is vital to adaptation. You know, I always think about, again, thinking about human design affects how I consider so many things in my life is like adaptation. So one step back is like the health of an ecosystem is directly core is, is positively correlated to its biodiversity, right? So if there's, think about if all of a sudden in an ecosystem that is, uh, that there's three different species in it and all of a sudden the temperature changes, those three species, species cannot exist in that temperature change and it creates a desert, a life desert, right? It creates this biodiversity fall. If there's 10,000 species in that same place, yeah, you might lose 10% of the species, but the rest have in their mutative adaptability, the ability to, to meet those changes. So the less diversity, the less adaptable. Mm. So we need a diversity of individual thought, of, of collective thought. We need a diversity of relativist viewpoints of ways of seeing the world so that we can adapt. If we're focused on just one way of viewing the world, and then we're met with a difficult challenge like politics, ecological crises, all of these things, and we don't have other ways of considering it, uh, it's just gonna crumble, right? And that's the value of diversity. Um, and the individuals are the ones who are generating that diversity. They're the sort of start point in human yeah. design, you know? They're kind of the ones that challenges what's already here. And 
there's a lot of discomfort. Sometimes people don't like that. They get fired from jobs, you know, but that always leads to another group of people who might be able to embrace them, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, that, that good old individual rejection wound, you know, God yeah. bless it. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> thank you for dealing with the trauma of being rejected, because once you work past that, you actually share your knowing, your mutative knowing, and we need it, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's so refreshing to hear that. And it also gives others permission to fall back into themselves. And I know we still wanted to talk about the archetypes, but I'm a little bit, mm -hmm. I'm curious about your journey as learning about, I'm a mental projector. How does that fit in? Like, was that a shock into your system <laughs> or was it validating? I think it was all the above. It was deeply validating um, when I first learned about it. You know, I'd always struggled to keep up. You know, I think when I was younger, easily could have diagnosed me with ADD and ADHD. I was even medicated, took uh, different medications for that at different points in my life. Um, and there was, uh, I, I do not identify with a lot of diagnoses anymore. Um, and so it was this sort of reckoning of like, oh, yeah, of, like, I'm always exhausted. And, and actually to talk about my mental health journey, because it really was so supportive in this was realizing that my lack of focus, my um, sort of scatteredness, that executive dysfunction, all of that was actually a result of nervous system uh, being out of whack, essentially, being not attuned to not knowing what I needed in those moments, and constantly being in a dysregulated nervous system that didn't allow for focus, that didn't allow for connection in the same way, didn't allow for all of these, these things that, that were like normal or necessary to do what was expected of me. Mm -hmm. And when I learned that I was a mental projector and I learned about my open root and my open ego um, and having no motors, it was like all of a sudden I was like, oh, yeah, this is, these are transitory aspects of myself that I don't mm -hmm. always have the energy that I don't always have this. And the most important thing for me is to come into a settled, regulated nervous system so that when the energy is there, I'm not either pushing it away and being in a total like free state or I'm not, you know, jamming past it with three cups of coffee and, you know, being listening to NPR the second I wake up or something, you know, like whatever it is. <laughs> and, and, and realize allowing, like allowing myself to open up enough to allow life to move through me as a projector, as with an open identity center, to allow life and the environment to move through me and to be an environmental authority, which is really how I consider um, mental projectors. Soundboarding is a strategy. I don't consider it an authority in the same way, um, in, my, in my viewpoint, my opinion, 1762. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so I guess you're, in your case, how do you access your your wisdom, your inner wisdom? We all have it. How do you yeah. access for yours? Yeah. Well, this is this is the thing, um, and this is still something that I contend with because there's times where I don't want to go along with the human design canon. You know, I was talking yeah. to somebody about how it's very natural. Like year three of human design, you're like, screw this whole thing, not interested. You know, year six or something, you're like, yeah, don't even care about this anymore. And then you realize you're already you're already too deep that you can't get out of it, and you just gotta keep going. With it. Um, but yeah, so for me, the as an outer authority, I don't have an inner authority. It's a really different experience. Same with reflectors; we don't have inner authorities. We are a a reflection. Uh, a representative, uh, a sort of fruit, if you will, of the environment. We grow from the environment. We are the environment in, in our systems. How we work, how we sort of result from that is, is different based on our incarnation cross, the definition we do have, um, channels, all those things. And so for me, the way that I, I feel like many mental projectors, because of our openness, we are here for, here for the cumulative worldview. We're here to take in everything. We're here to take in it all. So we're not making a decision from a splenic place. We're making a decision from a splenic, an ego, an identity, a sacral, an emotional, and a mental place. You know, like we're really trying to capture the entire experience and codify it cognitively with um, our defined ajnas, because all mental projectors have defined ajnas, whether it's connected crown or to the throat. 
And that's very different. That's why we're outer thirds. We're advice givers. We're here to go, here's everything you need to think of. I often tell people like when they want my advice, I'm like, I'm probably going to give you more options than I'm going to give you one option. You know, I'm, I'm not going to help you figure out what's the best. I'm going to tell you what is here. And that sometimes clarifies, mm. you know, people think that A and B are the only answers. And the mental projector goes, well, I've looked around this whole thing and here's uh, C through Z. Sometimes that is actually a deeply helpful thing. And so I think about him, I think about mental projectors as our wisdom is directly correlated to what our environment pulls out of us, what our environment challenges us with, what experiences come to us through our environments. And that's why the environment for a mental projector, the number one most important thing, <laughs> period. Yeah. It's just like, if you're in an environment in which you are stuck with, you know, different people or this certain friend groups or in certain places, you are limited by that environment, right? And that's a I really have, hard, yep. I, you're reminding me of something that, so a friend of mine this week, she's a mental projector. She was, she answered a phone call and there's so many scam phone calls and in her body, she knew it was a scam. But that person isolated her. She was like, you're going to leave work now. You're going to help with this criminal investigation. And she was like, I don't know why. I kept, I knew in my body it was wrong, but I went along and did all the things this scammer was trying to get her to do. It wasn't, he completely isolated her for two hours on the phone, like hammering. And I think with any kind of scam or anybody who's trying to take advantage of you, they grab on to fear fear and like what's going to happen to you and I'm wondering like was it because he completely overrode her that she was like I knew it in my body was wrong but I don't know why I did it yeah I mean I think our openness there is that potential and to bring in a term um, that I've been exploring more recently is like this sort of fawning response in our nervous system where like when we're threatened we actually go along with things just mm. to sort of appease and to just make it easier and for it to be go smoother in a, in a way it's yeah. like and that's a self uh you know um, it's a coping mechanism a survival skill yeah totally absolutely it keeps us safe and yeah there is this there is this piece of um being so open and having openness and this is really for any type but specifically for like i mean if you have a ton of openness you are being influenced a ton definitely different for mental projectors and reflectors but yeah, there, there is just this, um, oh man, there's this quote that Alok Pindias does, did about mental projectors. And he's just talking about like, the biggest choice we make is who we are connected with and mm -hmm. our environment, because we're sort of riding their energy, you know, and they aren't impacting us and they are affecting us and who you let into that space, who you listen to, especially if you have an open crown, all those things. Um, it's, it's huge. It's, it's it's gigantic so many people with inner authority they can go run along with somebody else no problem and then they go off and go back to their life but with all that openness it's really uh, it, it affects us you know so i'm careful about talking about this because i don't want there to feel there to be a sense of weakness because um, <laughs> it's not weakness or that there's uh you know it's just kind of like a curse or these mm -hmm. things and this is what I think is so important about human design is that when you choose to engage with the experiment, you are, are choosing to put limitations on yourself. And when you put those limitations on yourself, it's just like the creative limitations of an artist, right? You know, if like if you, if you have every medium at your disposal, yes, you can do anything, um, but you might not be good at 90% of them. You might, it might be take you 10 years to learn all of that media instead of one week to learn the one type. So like pick the canvas, pick the paints, fall within that there's a creative potential within the limitation. And so when, when you step into human design, and I think it's the hardest for mental projectors, because there is this sort of like, you take on a lot of limitation by saying, essentially you have no inner authority and you are a result of your, of your um, environment. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is a little bit of a scary thing. So I'm feeling some hesitation of even naming that because I don't want a mental projector out there to go, oh God, I'm just trapped. And nothing's happening. And I think the choice you have is to co-create with life, right? Mm -hmm. So my analogy is we're all in the river of life. We all got boats on the river of life. Some of these generators out here, they got a GPS system and a defined identity. They got a big ass motor because they got four motors in their start. 
They got like five channels to their throat. They're zooming. They're doing this thing, right? They're running that river. I'm in uh, a lowly boat with no rip, nothing, no paddle. There's a fog bank. There's, I can't see what's happening. The water's dark. Like there's nothing, right? And so I have to trust where the river's going, but mm-hmm. I also have to be aware. I also have to have come from this place of openness and and not be putting, being obscured all the time in my own conditioning, but this place of like, oh, I'm, I'm open to what life has. I'm surrendered to life. And when I come around the bend, and as I come around the bend, there's a big, beautiful rose bush leaning over the river. I'm going to be there to pluck it. I'm going to be there to be aware enough to, to grab it. And so that's where this term that I like to use of co-creating with life. That yes, you are surrendered to it. Yes, you know, we can all wear the hat Ra used to wear. No choice, right? This is all me- a mechanistic universe. And there is an awareness and presence and being that allows you to be in that no choice existence and, mm-hmm. and be engaged with it. You know, so this co-creation with life as opposed to, oh, no, I, I'm just being dragged around by life. And right, <laughs> right. I used to joke with a friend because we're ta- we were like discussing or just entertaining the like the concept of um, passenger consciousness, but like no, no control. I'm like, yeah, but you're not dead <laughs> in the car. Like you're you're alive. You are experiencing life. You're not just being dragged along. You're not being abducted. <laughs> Yeah, I like that term. It's like the passenger is, you you got into the car, hopefully. Like you were like, open the door and said, wherever you want to take me. And you sat in the back. You didn't get dragged. And yeah, you didn't get dragged. Up. You're not like dozed with something. Like things are just <laughs> happening. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's the most important part because there's people out there that I'm like, yeah, human design is not right for you at this time. Please don't do yeah. it. Please yeah. like go. There's so many other ways. And, you know, I see all these brilliant people that every time I do a reading it seems like with somebody who's like 65 and older I just have this profound sense and I'm like I'm certainly not telling you anything new Mm. you know this about yourself you see this about yourself you've changed your life many many times to come into alignment with this with who you are and it's like this just weird experience of like oh you already figured it out. You've lived a life. And I think there's something innate in us that pulls us towards self, that pulls us towards being who we are. You know, and I like to imagine that it's even being called out of us by our environments, that when we walk through the park, the trees are going, please be you. We need you as you, right? And the people around us, even when they're frustrated with us or we make a choice that affects them and we're dealing with the negotiations of being in relationship around that, there's still this part that's deep within them that says, please be you because you give me permission to be me, mm-hmm. right? And that, it, it is, it's, I don't know, it's just, we we need that. And it is important to move towards that. Yeah. I don't know where I was going with that or how that started, but there it is. <laughs> that was needed. That was definitely needed. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the archetypes? How do you use them or how do you weave them into our myth mending? Yeah. Um, so in this, I think there was just a name, like what I, what I call myself online and sort of the, the umbrella for my the name I give my work is, is I call it archaic remnant. And archaic remnant is actually a term that Freud coined talking about this unconscious, instinctual sort of lineage that we carry, each of us carry as animals, right? As an animal being, you know, and you imagine that when animals come out of the womb, some of them know immediately what to do, how to survive. Mm-hmm right? They, they learn how to walk, right? Um, humans having like the longest, I think we have the longest gestation period or the longest time before being, being independent is even possible. Mm. Like what, <laughs> 10 years before? I was going to say 10, moment. 20 years, depending on how they were conditioned, 30 years. <laughs> and, and, and just as a little interesting note here, as culture complexifies, it takes longer for us to understand the complexity of being. You know, and that's why this sort of shift going like you're an adult when you're 15. Now it's like you are actually an adult when you're 30, because that's how much time it takes for your mind and everything to understand the complexity of being human and all of its dimensions. Um, and that's sort of the Uranian shift that happens as well. Um, so archaic remnants are these instinctual aspects of ourselves that speak to what it means to be human and to be conscious to have consciousness right 
And um, these are also, for, for, uh, Jung sort of expanded on this, this notion because Freud was just like, oh, these are what make us just kill somebody or lash out and attack somebody or cry or, you know, these things that seem to come out of nowhere. They come from the unconscious, but they're mostly survival oriented. That's what he was talking about, the archaic remnants, mm -hmm. right? Um, that sort of animal way of being. And, and Jung expanded is like, no, there's actually this large pantheon of these configuration, these conglomerations of human experience, feeling, um, internal states, felt senses, all of these things that are so, that are patterned in human experience and conscious experience as humans that they get repeated over and over and over again. And Joseph Campbell's like uh, cross-cultural myth sort of analysis showed that there's these patterns of the mythic, of the subjective experience of being human. And the subjective is, what do I feel? What is inside of me? What, is, what does my culture tell me this is about? And there's these patterns. Right, that all human beings share in. And so I like to think of it as this beautiful unconscious ground in which human beings truly commune. Like this is a place where we all, this is what we all share. This is the human legacy. Mm -hmm. Are these unconscious patterns you can think of? And we call them archetypes, archetypal. And so there's the mother, there's the father, there's the king and the queen, the ones in charge, there's um, the child, the boy, the girl, right? These things that are, every human being experiences in some capacity, right? Um, and so from these archetypes, and as we complexify culture, more complex archetypes start showing up, right? And so when you look at the tarot, it is literally, I don't even, I can't even remember, is it 62 cards in the deck, right? Those so, are <laughs> all archetypes, oh, yeah. right? Each one of those is in a, in a, a conglomerate of human experience, feeling, and, and feeling. It's a such subjective human experience. And those are universal. There's a reason that tarot applies to so many people in people's lives. Um, and archetypes do change based on the cultural context. So the archetypes of indigenous folks are deeply rooted in the land, are deeply rooted in their ecologies of which they've lived since time immemorial, right? So you know, they're looking at Raven as this trickster energy because that was something that was constantly reflected. Every day they wake up, oh, what's Raven up to today? Doing something to bother us, right? But that's not reflected in other places in the world. But there is a, the trickster underneath that as a base archetype is reflected in that. Mm -hmm. So archetypes and archetypal systems, the I Ching, human design, astrology, all of them are archetypal systems. The 12 signs are different archetypes. They're different conglomerations of of human experience, human behavior, and, 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 and are being conscious. Mm -hmm. And when you understand things archetypally and you start exploring archetypal systems, um, they, that's where the complexity piece comes in again, where you start to weave them together and you start to see, oh, I'm having a hexagram 15 experience held in the moon by hexagram 14. And what does that mean? What do all three of those <laughs> archetypes together mean? And those, and those help us narrate our experience of being human mm -hmm. so to work with archetypes is to work with it's like you're an editor and you're trying to story tell a story narrate your human experience and you're going i'm having a leo moment that went into gate 15 that reflected my identity center being open and was very raven-like and trickster and, and you're using this to help you better understand the complexity of being human and this is something deeply devoid from the Western colonial objective worldview that's going that we are mechanistic, period. Mm -hmm. We are just science experiments, essentially. And everything is like a causal objective experience, which, again, we can split hairs and argue about the objective nature of mind. But the reality is, is that as humans, we have a subjective experience of that. And if we don't have a language to explore our subjective experience, to explore the complexity of it, the increasing complexity of it, because getting bullied in a community of five people is very different than getting bullied by hundreds of thousands of people right. on, on yeah. Instagram, right? It's a new experience yeah. um, in our human experience. So using archetypes and these different healing modalities, which are archetypal, all of them, uh, it helps us understand us, understand our experiences. And those of us coming from a secular worldview 
where we're not really connected to a religious teaching, this is novel. This is needed. It starts going, oh, I make sense. I have a context. I actually, and from this, I can make meaning. And those who are religious, you know, they have St. Joseph or whatever. I don't know any of the saints, so I'm this. <laughs> but St. Joseph himself, who cares if that is a real person? He is an archetype. What were his, what were his deeds? How did he act? You know, and when people who are Catholic or something, they go, you got to be more more like that, or you should go read about this person because they're trying to call out that archetypal experience of being human that St. Joseph was a representative of, you know. It just clicked for me. Like I've heard it, I understand it mentally, but now it's like, it's almost like the essence of those energies in something that we can relate to, basically. Basically, it's not basic. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and when you and when you reconfigure religion and all of these systems as non-objective things, right? These aren't necessarily true with a capital T. And the question of whether they are or not, again, not interested in having a discussion about that. How do they subjectively apply to us? There are many lessons that Jesus can teach us because he represents an aspect of our humanity and our divinity, right? And so of course we can lean on those teachings. There are many teachings the Buddha teaches us. There's many things in human design. And that's my one critique and sort of where I bring in sort of the critical human design stuff is I don't want to talk about human design as an objective system. Mm -hmm. I think it's valid. I think people should. I want to see all my, um, you know, quantum mechanics geeks like geeking the (laughs) hell out on that. Please go, 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 go. But for me, the question of whether or not it's objectively true is null. It's about how it maps and helps me narrate my subjective experience of being human gives me meaning, gives me purpose, gives me intent, right? So that I understand I'm a mental projector. This is a limitation I take on with belief so that I can move through the world and bring my gifts to the world. And from my subjective experience, it works out fairly well, <laughs> right? Right. It supports me. And please, if it's not supporting you, put it aside for a while. Like that's, you know. Right. Um, yeah. Because there's many, there's many approaches to human design, many languages. It's almost the same thing but in different languages kind of how another reason that I found it so fascinating when we were learning about the origins of human design was like all these different cultures like you said did have a subjective experience they did orient it towards those archetypes and they tried to interpret in their language in their methods and somehow they did very similar things in different languages and now you know somebody found a way to like they fit together to tell a bigger story. I'm like, whoa, this is just, how did they do it? They didn't even know the other person it says. They were so unaware, but because they wanted to interpret the world, that was possible. But, and a lot of people get into alignment or healing through different ways. Maybe quantum human design is what works for somebody. Maybe no human design, just, you know, living in a while works for someone else. And it's just so important to also hold all of that. And this is where I'm like, forever indebted to raw because i'm like i i you know i believe that it, it it is possible that if you are potentially high on something that you can have some downloads you can have some you know uh some clarity some knowing come through but what he did the synthesis of these multiple different archetypal systems the kabbalah is a i forget is a 12 centered channel connection between the 12 uh these hebrew sort of condense uh condensed uh, what's the word i'm looking for but their archetypal representations of of divinity and humanity Mm -hmm. right the I Ching, these 64 um hexagrams that represent these 64 these different combinations of elemental realities the the chakra system the seven centers that represent different archetypes right? Bodily senses, energetic senses, emotions, all those things, all archetypal. He weaved them together in a logical format. Mm -hmm. He's not just um, saying that, oh, this chakra system is like gate 64, (laughs) right? He's not saying that. He's, he actually put them in a logical container that is self-fulfilling. Like there's not a way to break down the math, the math works, right? Logically Mm -hmm. put together. And the way that he did that, again, it almost created, again, these limitations within, this is really getting into meta human design stuff. Yeah, like, please. <laughs> the, 
those limitations that he created by logically interlocking all of these different systems allowed us to explore new ways that these different archetypes connect to each other. And to me, he's giving us this extremely complex archetypal system that gives us so much opportunity to configure complexity, mm -hmm. archetypal complexity. And so now instead of going, I'm having a, a heart chakra experience and also I'm having trouble speaking. It's like, oh, oh, there's a gate that goes from the heart to the throat. What's it about? Right? And so it allows us to, to understand a more these deeper, complex archetypal experiences, these human experiences. Brilliant. I think absolutely brilliant. And if you go super hard in Western astrology, people start bringing in all the trines and oppositions and uh, progressed moons and all the comments. And, you know, it starts getting so complex. And that complexity is necessary to better understand the complexity of being human. Mm. Like, and that's where following that we find more. Like, we don't know these, these meteors and, um, you know, different, different planetary bodies, planetoids were there until we could see them. But the, about the time we could see them was also the time that we started to complexify. Right, to be able to not attach meaning, but break down meaning, understand. Yeah. And that's why I'm actually fully for people exploring having yeah. thir 13 sign uh, Western astrology systems, you know, yeah. or these different things of like changing because, you know, we are not static in nature as human beings. We actually rapidly evolve due to our cultural ability to do, like we can... We can hold adaptation in culture. So we don't need to change our bodies to adapt or our instincts to adapt. We can adapt on an abstract level. Mm. And it's just more complexity. So I'm all for people exploring new ways of configuring archetypes and understanding ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Just talking about the complexity of human experience. <laughs> I can't believe you've been like working through this. I don't have the mental energy to do it. So I appreciate someone sharing these because otherwise my mind is like, but how? And then it just breaks. I'm like, I don't know how. <laughs> and the, this is, I got the defined Ajna to throat. That's what I'm here to do. Doing anything about this, writing a bunch about it. That's, that's, that's on you. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're kind of trying to activate people. <laughs> I'm like, here's the ideas. Let's, um, <laughs> but getting them into action is is requires community for me. <laughs> right, right, right. You also touch on masculine ar archetypes, mm -hmm. and right now you're using it through the human design lens. How are you? Tell us more about it. I'm like, I don't even know how to ask that question. It's so <laughs> complex, so layered. Well, I don't think it takes anybody. Very, it's not very hard for anybody to imagine the state of masculinity um, being in upheaval right now from sort of the Me Too movements, the toxic mas masculinity sort of being a pop idea now. Um, what has defined men and what what men are, what is a man, all those things. So it's been deeply challenged, upended, all those things. And, 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 good, and that's a good thing. Like there's there's plenty of notions of what masculinity was based on sort of a Western colonial culture that no longer worked and were deeply um, caused the vast majority of the world's problems, I will say. <laughs> yeah. I like that you said no longer worked because I think because we've evolved so much and we've gotten in touch with those complex, deeper parts of ourselves that wasn't available thousands of years ago no one's going to be thinking about their feelings when their survival was needed when like you know someone being strong was needed so i wanted to like add that it's so important to recognize that too yeah and and that's the thing too is like i'm a big believer in like we do things for a reason i don't i don't actually believe like there is yes there is truly evil folks out here that are potentially psychopathic that are just really doing some stuff because they just who knows it's really it's hard for us to define most of us do things for a reason, even when bad things happen. And I think about this lineage of sort of the post, like sort of Christianity changing these indigenous worldviews, language changing these indigenous worldviews um, that created a lot of trauma in, in Europe and created these different cultures of continuous trauma. And when I think about masculinity, when we think of masculinity, it really is this sort of Western colonial idea of masculinity but of course in it is these basic archetypes of being a man of, of, of masculinity um 
And so it's, it's how do we reconfigure? Because I actually think that there's people hundreds, thousands of years ago who, who had a very advanced idea of, of what masculinity was and how it operated in culture and how it operated in community and all of those things. And I use the term masculinity not and man not as a designation of gender or even sex. I use it as, a, as an understanding of these are energies that are archetypal. Masculine mm-hmm. energy is in every single human being. How we use it, configure it, to what degree, that's the question. Um, so for me, the human design space is like 95% women. Um, maybe a little bit of that is, is queer folks too. And then like <laughs> less than 5% men. And I think that there is this, this you know, sort of ongoing question of what is it about masculinity that doesn't allow men to explore spirituality from the place of like an embodied emotional sense. And human design is an embodied system, right? Men in the Western colonial context have come to value their intellect and their sort of strength, their ability to do things and make an impact. That is, that is what has been reflected to them. That has been their only choice for how they show value and are valued in culture, right? And so when I think about human design, it totally, and we actually living our designs and living into whether we have defined emotions or undefined, like it, it pulls, it, it knocks us right out of that. And I'm, um, have been in masculine work for a while, men's work. And I was always going like, we need the human design in this process. Like it is mm-hmm. such a helpful tool to understand ourselves. And um, so I'm, I'm really wanting to sort of spearhead that, that movement and get this sort of narrative out here of like, how do we work with the human design knowledge in the context of masculinity? Because the vast majority of it not is just folks serving their communities, which is mostly women, mostly white women, mm-hmm. that um, in, the, in this spiritual wellness space. And we really need new, new, more complex forms of masculinity that have a depth to their emotions, their spiritual experience, and how they hold their communities and their loved ones that can sort of slow down and end these cycles of trauma and abuse. And, um, you know, and I say that with like the deepest compassion in my heart, that men who hurt are hurting. Like that is so clear to me. And they don't even have, many of them don't have even the capacity to understand the complexity of where that hurt's coming from, you know? And so working with human design, working with other men who have walked those paths, um, it's, it's, it's life-changing. It's changed my life completely. And it's important to actually confront masculinity because we either avoid it or want to subdue it. Um, and we don't need to subdue masculinity. It just has to come into proper balance with the world. Yeah. And in fact, one of the primary archetypes of masculinity is generativity, is creating things, is using that will, that strength, that, that ability to, to, to protect and to hold boundary and hold all these things. That's, those are all masculine energies. And those, um, when those are brought into the world in generative ways, in life-giving ways, not destructive ways, it, it's, it's necessary for the world, you know? So I just, we, we need to start talking about it more. And there's so many beautiful people who are. Um, but the options for men are go with the good old, sort of good old boy, you know, locker room talk, Marvel man, tough, you know, stiff upper lip, tough it up, don't cry, no emotions, all of those things, which is quickly fading, I will say. We're becoming much more attuned. Or go into sort of, to borrow Traver Groham, uh, I don't know how to say his name, his last name, but Traver, he wrote Man Uncivilized to, towards the, the, new, the new age nice guy, which mm-hmm. is completely devoid of the masculine experiences of, of anger and power and all of these things that are deeply dangerous. And if they're not worked with and taken from the shadow into conscious awareness and configured, they cause more harm. So the new age night guy might be attuned, might be listening and all these things. But if there's not a claiming of that wholeness of masculinity, it comes out sideways. And it comes, anything that we hold in shadow does show itself to us at some point. Right. You know? Yeah. When it becomes suppressed, because again, like humans, they want an approach. Masculine has been too much. Here's the feminine energy and they try to push the masculine, but we need the balance of both. Mm-hmm. Wow. 
and and thank you know i deeply honor and thank all of the feminists and and women who have worked really hard to have their voices claimed to step the, into the world and, and done this work because that's actually allowed men to start reconsidering their masculinity and um you know it, it's it's a little it's a little edgy for me to say, but I think one of the biggest things that, you know, women and femme folks need to consider is how they uphold masculinity as it is now, instead of allowing it to become something more. Because there's so yeah. many ways that we can be, you know, doing our inner work and all those things, but we do benefit from the masculine showing up in the world in a certain ways, whether that's from going to war or protection or all of these things. Um, and something to that effect is I just like to remind folks that the vast majority of, of people who die in war are men, right? And, yeah. and our nations are sort of built on men's bodies. And that's just something that's not talked about because there's plenty yeah. of other horrible things that are happening in the world and violence that is, is equally as needing a spotlight. But it just it is it's a question I like to posit for, for everybody. It's like, how are we upholding masculinity in this toxic way even all the subtle ways that we do it you know yeah. oh yeah and it's not an it's not an easy question there's a lot of complexity there <laughs> yeah because so much of of these little not little like these stories are also in the language of the things that you like you throw like a girl like these little things that are so common but also like whoa like what does it even mean like it it can be so damaging at a level that we're not even aware of especially if men has never they've never had the space or the tools to talk about or hold about these things because that was a strength to not show emotion and when generations of like different cultural men around the world are so used to that it's not easy to just access that part yeah there's i mean one you have to have the example period Ooh, yeah. you have to you have to know that there's a possibility for it to be different than it is um, and so that needs to be there and then, and then all the work to actually step towards it as is necessary. Yeah. And, and also just one thing to add in here is that, um, there is this aspect of, of, of toughness, I will say strength and initiation that is vital to, to every human, but to men in a deep way is that they, they do need, I deeply needed to receive initiations. I deeply needed to have my capacity had checked my sort of and pushed through and and to and to, and to mature by actually having a lot of pressure put on me and mm -hmm. there is this sort of orientation towards um emotional openness and safety that is so valuable so needed right so we don't just harm each other constantly all the time and there is this edge in masculine work of no you need to be pushed to it you do need to to step into some strength you do need to feel that sort of intensity so that you you know what you're capable of and you and you have a sort of strength that can be used in a generative way again right you know yeah, there is this part of like there is this sort of pushing <laughs> power energy that is part of being a masculinity that um, yeah. is a little uncomfortable for people that um when you go to masculine men's work when you do men's work and you go to men's groups that shows up and it's beautiful but like mm. you get challenged <laughs> right and having the safe space to be able to explore what is what is this where does it come from the natural way and versus the condition way and all of that again everything is layered <laughs> and and i always like to tell people you know um being a very sensitive uh emotionally attuned young man um one of the best things that ever happened to me was to get punched in the face by a man who loved me at one of these groups <laughs> you know and, and that is such a funny thing to say I was like I got my lip busted and it was one of the best things that I ever experienced because there was this way of me understanding that there is strength in the world and there are things that are difficult and you can be held and supported and carried through all of that through relationship and it was just this because one of the biggest sort of narratives of masculinity is the lone wolf is this one who is constantly on their own constantly solving out and even in the spiritual wellness space it's these men who are you know 
spiritually having these experiences, but it's all their own stuff and it's all their own, but they're not in this, they don't necessarily trust other men. They're not, maybe don't even trust other women and they're, and they're, or anybody in between. And um, that is really, it's a, that, that's not a good life, you know? <laughs> so yeah. yeah, loneliness is a, is a big part of the men, of men's experience. Yeah. Yeah. And how to, because the strength that you talk about is also necessarily within us to build resiliency. It is. And it's yeah. so easy to be demonized. Like things are always black and white. Sometimes when we look at it, it's like, ah, <laughs> this is good. This is bad. But again, holding the complexity, I feel like I got a little sample of what you do in myth mending here. <laughs> Powerful. Yeah, I, the complexity is the, uh, that's my, that's my new, that's like my thing. <laughs> that's like what I focus on because, um, some you know i always call it gemini energy mercury energy uranus energy of like we got to be able to hold many viewpoints confusion yeah. uh, we have to be able to flip between and we have to figure out how to do that well because that's what's configuring complexity is the name of the game mm. in, in my mind wow i'm like processing all of that <laughs> is that how your mind works all the time too is this what just goes up there <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think, I think that may be. And that's what I, I mean, I love looking at um, human design. Again, this gives me so much context and helps me understand what my essence is, is that I have yeah. that 1762 and that 1156. 1156 is subjective telling, subjective story. 1762 is objective information. Mm -hmm. And I'm constantly going, how do I work between the objective and subjective realities we're in? Like the hard science is the hard, the sort of truths with a capital T and our human experience or subjective mm. experience and emotions and all that constantly in that tension of how do we weave these together? How do we talk about these together? Right. Because it's hard to do. You And you do it really well, like at least for someone who has no clue about that and learning about it. And I'm able to understand it in a way that's like, oh, okay, now it, it kind of activates me for the next thing. It's instead of leaving me confused, like what do I do with my life now? <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. And this is what I love about stepping into this work is that we can look at our human design, we can look at our incarnation cross and gain so much understanding of who we are and where we're headed. And the myth mending to me takes it the step further and goes, okay, this is who you are and where you're headed. Now weave yourself into this web of meaning and place and community and ecology, and let your gifts be seen, let them flow out of you, let them be called out of you. And I think that that's the missing part that so many people who study human design for a long, long time, they understand all of it in their mind. They maybe even feel it in their body, but then how does it ripple out? What does it go towards? And that is not a human designs problem. That's the problem of living in a culture that's deeply secular and disconnected. Mm -hmm. So how do we bring that connection and that communion and that, that meaning back in, and then just let the design show up to that, you mm -hmm. know? I'm starting to think this would be amazing to anybody who's listening and have the resources to make it into like a school program or not even a program because then it sounds constrictive but like an opportunity for even teenagers children to be able to like find meaning in who they are especially at that age yeah this is um I just got to put a call out for to Bill Plotkin's work you know he does these these initiations these mm -hmm. uh sometimes called vision fasts and you know, the main point is that we need them to grow as human beings. We need these experiences to grow and to find and to commune with spirit, in his case, um, to, to understand our eco-cultural niche. That's where I get the term from, is I get that term from Bill Plotkins, that each of us has a place, has a purpose, has beingness, and, and we're meaningful to this planet, to our communities, to the world around us. This is not just an empty, objective life. We all have a place we have to figure out what that is. We have to figure out who we are and we have to figure out where we fit and we have to get to work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that identity changing or not knowing. Cause I think there's also a lot of guilt for whenever we hit the dark night of the soul, like what have I been doing all my life? And then, you know, we turn that energy inwards. Like you said, like one of the first things I learned about human design, using all the doubt, the why, the who, <laughs> the how and turning it <laughs> inwards and thinking what is wrong with me but just a subtle reframe and having the right support systems to see well actually this might be the issues that you're experiencing but nothing's wrong with you 
and and I would just say I fully don't expect to have these figured out these questions figured out for me until my into the 60s 70s if I'm lucky you know but there is that ability to see little glimpses of it and you go oh there is something there there is something I'm walking towards mm-hmm. you know that doesn't mean I got it figured out I'm talking here very certain we got a lot of certainty in my voice <laughs> I have by far not figured out all of these things <laughs> but I know that it's important for me and I am coming from a place of understanding how difficult it is. And just in that understanding that we are up against great odds, there's a little compassion of like, we can take the time. It's not going to be figured out all at once. Yeah. How do we resource ourselves to go on this, on this walk? This one mm-hmm. that'll take a long time and maybe never even ends, but it's just, it feels good to move towards. Yeah. And still smell the roses in between because it's not about (laughs) the destination. (laughs) It's nice to get there, but that's not all there is. Thank you so much for this. And I do want to ask you a little bit about something that you've been sharing, which are the poems to the gates in human design. I love, I love everything that you share. The poems, there's like extra magic to it because like you said this is like the the creative energy where you're not like trying to challenge or critical human design I love that but it's also like it's me having fun <laughs> mm-hmm. how did that come to be you know so I'm, I'm studying right now for uh, a degree in a master's degree in in creative writing and I just really again with this intent in mind of like I want to bring the hexagrams back down to this eco-cultural context this like deeply felt this sensuous, this, um, you know, based in place and earth and animal and, and our other than human kin and, and explore writing poems that try to capture all of that complexity, right? When, when you're talking about complex, we talk about complexity a lot. I'm like, there's a lot, you know, either you can write a 40 page thesis or you can write a poem that captures the essence of it. This is you like know? full circle, <laughs> just to show many ways of expression. And that's why the poems for me are just these little exercises. Sometimes it takes me an hour. Sometimes it takes me five minutes. And I'm just going, how can I let my subjective creative voice try to capture a complex hexagram and the experiences that go along with it? Sometimes it's like a direct, I use words that are directly from my understandings of the gates and the hexagrams. Other times it's just feelings and senses that don't seem to to align, but it feels right to talk about them. And so there's just little explorations and and I hope to have, when I get through the year, hope to have a book that will sit on people's coffee, coffee uh, tables. <laughs> please, please. How many, do you know how many you've done so far? Um, Probably, probably close, not quite, not quite half. So I've probably done 20 something. It's not actually that much now that I think about it, but there's 64 in total. Um, I'm close to about halfway through. So do you have a favorite one? Um, I don't know if I have it off the top of my head, but I think, I think grandmother spider is my favorite. So gate 21, um, that mm-hmm. was an archetype that really, you know, really early on at, you know, having my 1156, I love metaphor. I love coming up with these different ways of understanding things and trying to condense it. And so gate 21, which is all about control and this ability to like that biting through that ability to manage what is necessary to keep us um, safe and alive. I just thought about this energy of this grandmother spider of like this fierceness, this kind of scariness even, and also like holding it down, knowing what's going on at all times and having no problem biting somebody's head off to to do that. And it feels like a sacred responsibility to carry that energy. And it's also hard to carry well. And so Mm. I loved writing about that because it's something Mm. that I always, people with that, I'm always like, yeah, it's a good energy. You know, it seems like, (laughs) I'm just calling you controlling and that you're a micromanager. <laughs> it's actually good, but you need to work with it. <laughs> I, I feel like you calling it grandmother spider really made it like you brought the wisdom of that energy. Cause I have to 21. I'm like, you know, sometimes I can like want to control certain things. Like, oh, okay. But then also there's a the wisdom. There is like a protective maternal instinct behind it. So absolutely. Oh, thank you for that. Was, was there one that was the hardest for you? I'm not sure about that. There's ones that have been very difficult to write. And like I always joke about the 22 because I've struggled with that for so long until I eventually wrote like a joke poem about it. (laughs) 
And because it was so hard and I was just like, well, it's about moodiness and I'm not in the mood to write this poem. And Ooh. I remember posting that and just j- about a joke and it's like the most engaged with one of the poems, <laughs> <laughs> which cracks me up. That was the hardest one to write. And I literally gave up and just put out like kind of a whatever. Yeah, and, um, yeah. And that was the most relatable one to the 22s. Yeah, it was. It was great. It's funny. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Thank you so much for this. I can probably talk for another hour, but maybe we can do another part in the next Absolutely. couple of months. Are you ready for that. some rapid fire questions? Let's let's hit them. What's the best compliment you've ever received? Oh, that's a hard one. Um, I think just that just that that people feel safe around me. That's been something I've received more recently in my life. And it's, 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 it's really beautiful to, to receive that, to, to have people around me and say like, oh, I feel, I feel safe around you. And that, that feels like, a, like I, I'm doing something right. <laughs> you know, that's in the back of my head. I was like, it just feels, thank you for the safe space. But I didn't say it out loud. And then when you read it, I was like, oh. But honestly, like learning human design from you, it's been so safe to explore, to poke at it, to ask questions, to experiment, because there was never a sense of like, you're doing this wrong <laughs> or you're not supposed to ask there. So thank you for that. Um, a book yeah. that's changed your life. Oh, um, let's uh, Dune changed my life. I got a tattoo of a Chris Knight. Oh. Um, Dune changed my life. Uh, Original Instructions, a book by Melissa Nelson changed my life. Um, Spell the Sensuous, just recently read, changed my life. There's so many. That yeah, there's probably right a now. lot. So I can't, yeah. there's not a single one at all. <laughs> I do not have a single one. <laughs> what does coming home mean to you? Oh, that's a beautiful question. Um, I just recently got off a almost two week trip rafting through the Grand Canyon. And one of the most profound feelings that I had was this sense of care and safety that I felt by these waters that were very, like, powerful, like, aggressive, (laughs) objectively powerful, as in like millions of cubic pounds of water moving every millisecond or something. Um, And something that really landed me there and I think I've done a lot of work through this is is in that safety and in that holding I just I just have this profound sense of like I'm home here Mm -hmm. I feel home here and I feel home in 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 the earth and and of the earth and of places and um that's something I've taken a long time to cultivate and it feels like one of my deepest resources of, of feeling home in place especially the southwest for me that was beautiful what do you want more of um, I want more joy and stability. I am in my Saturn return shadow, mm-hmm. and I really am looking for that sort of the work that I'm setting myself up for now, you know, doing good work, loving that, and then also knowing it's 5 p.m. and it's time to put the work down, mm-hmm. and I'm going to go play video games for a while and go on a walk with my loved ones, and just needing a little bit more of that 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 Saturnian sort of uh, joy and consistency in my life that has felt ever elusive since I left the corporate world. <laughs> Part of the Saturn return. <laughs> it is. It is. Any advice or words for your younger self? Um, ooh, wow. That, yeah, there's just a couple ones, like one, it gets better. Mm-hmm. And two, that it, um, like you can, you can trust yourself, you know, I think I, I think those would be like, it's okay to trust yourself. It gets better. I think would be some really words to feel into and my younger self would love to feel into those. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, finally, where can people find you? Yeah, so most of my work right now is on Instagram. I'm really ramping up and transitioning into um, a lot of new things. I have a website, archaicremnant.com, and it is abysmal, but it's quickly getting up daily. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah, there's there's many things coming down the pipeline. There's the myth-mending sessions, which are these one-on-one 
very much what we talked about today. That's what I walk, help you walk, walk with you through uh, human design sessions as well. Incarnation cross readings, which you have an incarnation yeah. cross reading with me. Yeah. yeah, I still listen to it once in a while. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> Teo is, you've worked really hard at it, but you're also so gifted, so beautifully talented in synthesizing our energies. That's all I can say. <laughs> Go get an incarnation cross reading with Teo. <laughs> Yeah, and then and then finally, these this masculine archetypes and human design is going to be coming out in the next uh, month or two, and then I'm eventually going to be opening a community. So you can find me on Instagram and on my website, and there's plenty of of ways to work with me and engage with me. And yeah, mm. you also have a book club, right? Is it called a Meta oh, Modern yes. Book Club? Totally. So I have a Meta Modern Myth Menders Book Club. And um, it's every it's free at this moment. Um, it might become part of my larger community in the future. And we just get together every month and read interesting, complex books that help us under configure complexity and understand complexity and help us to understand our places in ecology and these myths that help bring that together. So it's just a place for thinkers. If you liked my if you liked hearing these ideas and are engaged with them and you're going, oh, that's something I've thought about. And I want to talk about, come join us, please read those books. Um, and yeah. 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 I'm like, I, I feel pulled to join right now. I don't know if it's the excitement, but if there's space for it, definitely. I feel so grateful to be able to talk to you, learn from you, and also just be able to witness this beautiful energy, those like complex reflections coming through, through you. Yeah, thanks so much, Jess, and and to give you some projector recognition, it's been an absolute joy to to support you, to teach, and to see the ways your brilliance shows up, your your sort of humble brilliance shows up, and and you're just like the things you create and uh, the knowledge that you hold. Like I've been I've been surprised by it, and like whoa, this is amazing. Like what? This is great. So um, I hope you put out a book soon with some of those human design designs and uh info you've been putting together so thank you so much Dale. yeah thanks jess thank you so much for listening to the whole and unleashed podcast if you're feeling pulled to get into action and want to connect within check out the align and embody journal on wholeandunleashed.com you'll also find resources on mindset human design an archive for past episodes of this podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share, leave a comment or review on iTunes and Spotify. Thank you so much for tuning in and have a wonderful day wherever you are.